Hi, today we'll be talking about the security situation in Haiti and issues related to negotiating with the non-state armed groups in the country. Joining me today is Vonda Felba Brown. She's the director of the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors and a senior fellow at Brookings. Welcome. Thank you. In our first series, speaking to experts on Haiti, we, many of the experts identified security as an initial challenge, I mean, as a very principal challenge to the overall stability of Haiti. Could you tell us how you think we've gotten to this place where the gangs and the armed groups are spreading uh, their territorial control throughout the country and how the violence has gotten so bad and why? Well, um, Andrew, there is good reason why um, many experts are focusing on the security situation. It really is the worse today than it has been in many decades. Uh, by some analysts, even uh, really the worst um, in um, the past 50, 60 years. The uh, territorial control, as you mentioned, of the gangs has grown significantly. Uh, but so has their uh, power, organization, and in fact, ambitions. There are maybe 200 gangs in Haiti, some half of which are um, centering on uh, Port-au-Prince, uh, the capital, which is also the place of the greatest uh, uh, economic power, as well as, of course, the location of the politicians and political and economic elites in the country. And the gangs are um, uh, now um, involved in uh, providing uh, violence or disrupting violence uh, or, or reducing violence as a mechanism to uh, privilege certain businesses, certain economic businesses. They are used by uh, the businesses to create uh, monopolies, to eliminate rival opposition or shut down uh, business opposition. And they are used by politicians uh, to deliver votes and um, also to uh, deliver political mobilizations and to create violence, uh, uh, to uh, create political challenges, pressure on uh, government or um, when, I, when they are used by governments and administration to suppress political opposition, to suppress protests, um, to suppress uh, dissident voices. This relationship between paramilitary groups at first uh, during the dictatorship uh, of the Devariers and later uh, between uh, the gangs that were known two decades ago as the Chimeres and today are referred to uh, as the gangs has been there for a long time. Uh, what and, and has really not escaped just about any administration, had some dealings with the gangs. What has been changing is the power relationship between the gangs and the politicians and the businesses. With uh, the gangs becoming strengthened vis-a-vis -vis them and vis-a-vis -vis the already uh, um, under-equipped, uh, undermanned, uh, uh, and often corrupt and infiltrated um, uh, and highly vulnerable uh, Haitian national police. So several other changes have taken place. Uh, th th these are uh, factors that have been evolving uh, over a number of decades, certainly intensely over the past two decades. The gangs have learned and strengthened through their bargaining with uh, the politicians and the businesses and governments, administrations that employ them. But things have become even more um, uh, dramatic since last summer, where President Moises uh, was uh, uh, the, where President Moises was um, uh, was uh, assassinated with uh, the level of extortion and the level of uh, fighting between the gangs uh, having gone up uh, significantly. And so today we are seeing the greatest levels of uh, homicides perpetrated by the gangs in a very long time. And at the same time, we are seeing the coalescing of the gangs into uh, two broad groupings, the so-called G9, the JPEP, uh, and um, a, a third um, uh, entity, uh, that, um, that has been really the most powerful gang that has now essentially joined the JUPEP. In this overall growth of their political power and power with businesses, they, they will be pivotal to any sort of way forward in a political settlement. We understand that there are lots of work, there's lots of work being done by the United States, the UN, and others to try to help the political process. Do you think that the gangs need to be formally or informally a part of this political process for any viable solution to go forward? 
Well, in reality, the gangs are part of the process because they are so interconnected uh, to uh, political interests and key political uh, parties and politicians uh, in Haiti. The question is what kind of bargaining will take place and who will be doing the bargaining. So bargaining with the gangs takes place daily. It's um, in civil society groups and humanitarian organizations that bargain with the gangs for access uh, to distribute um, uh, humanitarian uh, services. This is not new, uh, but this has become all the more intense as the territorial reach and ambition and power of the gangs has grown and as their violence, kidnappings, and extortion uh, has grown. Uh, the National Police uh, of Haiti bargains with the gangs, both as an institution, but also individual um, officers and individual commanders often engage in bargaining with the gangs. And you have some accounts that will say that perhaps half of the police is really connected uh, to uh, uh, the gangs. And very many officers live in uh, gang-controlled neighborhoods. Their economic survival depends on uh, supplements, bribes uh, from the gangs, but their physical survival and the physical existence of their families in their neighborhood is determined by uh, the gang's willingness to provide it or not. So, so today, you know, given the the power of the gangs. It's really, and the fact that there is no domestic Haitian entity that really has the capacity to dismantle or systematically suppress the gang. The Haitian National Police, which is backed up by uh, um, assistance from the United States, uh, has the capacity to mount certain operations, uh, uh, but they remain essentially piecemeal. It can make difference uh, in uh, achieving short-term goals as it did during the uh, era of MINUSTA, the UN force that was there between 2006 and 2017. But um, even with the international backing, it doesn't have the capacity to dismantle the gangs. Is there w are there better ways that the international community or, or their lessons learned from these types of negotiations and how we can transfer the confidence building measures perhaps built into that or, or the, the successes from those types of negotiations into these broader political negotiations? Is there something to be drawn from that? So even in Haiti itself, there have been different models of how to negotiate. Um, humanitarian actors such as um, international NGOs um, have uh, often negotiated uh, access by um, um, emphasizing that they will not provide um, any services, medical services or um, um, f food relief, if the gangs don't agree to impartiality and if they uh, try to um, steal, appropriate, uh, do humanitarian uh, uh, service uh, just toward themselves. Uh, and uh, of course, these uh, humanitarian international NGOs often have uh, very limited power. Their only power is to say, we will simply not provide the services. And to the extent that either the gangs want the services, they have no access to uh, medical facilities in the absence, and or the population wants the services, uh, that gives actually the NGOs a strength. So that's one vision of negotiations. The objective for the negotiator, humanitarian actors, is not to change the political uh, process, is not to change, weaken, uh, the power of the criminal gangs is not to uh, even perhaps reduce violence. It could simply be reduce violence only in the corridor so that services like medical care or earthquake distribution could be provided. Mm -hmm. A second model of negotiations is one that tries to change the power uh, of the end behavior of the criminal groups. Again, there have been international NGOs in Haiti trying to do that. They would try to condition um, Nonviolence, uh, or at least reductions in violence by the gangs by paying for uh, good behavior. So every month there would not be um, uh, high levels of violence incidents. Uh, the community would be rewarded with some material handouts like motorcycles, like a uh, motorcycle a week, a computer a week, m these um, fairly limited packages that nonetheless were uh, very um, substantial uh, in terms of what uh, poor gangs, which used to be uh, in uh, Haiti, uh, would otherwise have and their, their members would have. Of course, the problem with this bargaining is both that it teaches the gang 
you up violence in order to be negotiated with to get a payoff, and that the discretion of violence or not is solely at the hands of the criminals. It's a gang piece uh, that's, that's induced by uh, some sort of reward, some sort of material reward. The third set of uh, bargains th that have taken place are these bargains between Haitian politicians and for that matter politicians in Jamaica, in Brazil, in Trinidad and Tobago, that reward the gangs with big contracts, with uh, provision of substantial services in exchange for the gangs delivering votes, suppressing oppositions, uh, delivering uh, potentially financial contributions. And those are the most problematic uh, of the deals and they precisely teach the gangs that uh, 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 violence is a mechanism and, and its reduction eventually is a mechanism to payoffs. So in other settings, um, like for example, um, uh, in Norway and in some cases even in Latin American countries, the bargaining has taken place differently. And the model for this, uh, or, or one of the models for uh, this different type of bargaining known as focus deterrence, comes out of the United States. And Boston Operation Ceasefire in the early 1990s was one of the key models. The bargaining essentially said, we know key leaders uh, of your gang. We have this, um, this portfolio uh, of serious criminal charges on which we can indict you, you gang leader. Now, we will not exercise our prosecutorial capacity to indict you and arrest you if violence goes down or you can set you know, other conditions. And it's, uh, it's uh, a bargaining that's based uh, not just on uh, some sort of material reward, but that also comes in with coercive power. That's hard to do in a place like Haiti, which has such a um, uh, dysfunctional and under-equipped, um, corrupt um, uh, police force and where police officers are so vulnerable, but it's not impossible. One could imagine uh, using, uh, for example, special interdiction units with close and constant international supervision and vetting uh, to be able to deliver those uh, uh, limited um, uh, coercive punishments if certain red lines are violated. What would be the red lines depends on what the asks would be. In my view, it's uh, really impossible to imagine how uh, right now there could be a demand that the gangs just disarm and dismantle. The, the, the uh, mantra of DDR requires uh, a, a situation in which you have a strong victor or strong willingness uh, across the political scene to disarm. I don't see that we can dream of DDR uh, in a place like Haiti. But a reasonable ask, for example, could be that there is not uh, violence that prevents uh, people from voting. Now, unfortunately, I think the gangs will play a strong role in the votes. We are not going to have free elections in the sense of people truly exercising their will. But even reducing uh, the current levels of homicide, the, the fact that the roads have become uh, fully controlled, uh, many of the key roads are fully controlled by the gangs, certainly allowing greater freedom of operation and movement for people so they can cross into um, rival gang territories for schools, uh, for economic opportunities are all valuable ask that could be part of what uh, the bargaining is about in a way to reduce the violence from the, the, the current pitch uh, that it has. Uh, but we need to be very, um, very um, sober in what uh, are the realistic objectives. And, and ideally, we would want to structure any such bargaining by whoever it is conducted, politicians, local communities, perhaps some international mediators, international NGOs, to have some coercive pun punitive element and not be based solely on uh, handing out material rewards. What, what should the international community in the United States do to support, after this long history of, 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 of support, mixed history of support in, in Haiti, what can they do specifically in the security se sector, specifically to help with these points that you've raised on dialogue, helping communities, uh, support for recognizing accountability for the human rights abuses and recognizing human rights abuses? What can they do in the short and medium and long term uh, to try to 
help get things on the right track? So in the short term, um, I think there are several possible uh, points of interventions. The United States uh, is already supporting the Haitian National Police Force, including in building special interdiction units. I think it's very reasonable, appropriate to have a conversation about the purpose of the special interdiction units. And I would again suggest that rather than having um, desirable, but in my view, unachievable objectives of really uh, dismantling the criminal gangs or even significantly in the short term reducing their power, there could be exploration of how they use them, uh, how to, to use the SIUs to shape the behavior of the gangs toward less violence, toward less um, community repression, and how to marry the SIUs uh, with uh, any kind of uh, less problematic bargaining that could emerge. The second element is as we move toward uh, any kind of political transition and political process, uh, is to really carefully think um, through uh, what that will inevitably mean for bargaining between the politicians and the gangs and how to shape the politicians to make less problematic uh, bargains. There are various dimensions to it, uh, including that the United States has the capacity uh, to uh, indict uh, uh, negotiators with criminal groups. The United States has done it. It has done this recently um, after negotiations in El Salvador. Uh, that can be uh, a force for uh, the good in trying to shape the negotiations, but it could also unravel negotiations that might be inevitable. So really having a robust conversation between uh, any kind of external donors and uh, 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 support uh, uh, actors who might be trying to facilitate mediations about the inevitable realities of how bargaining with gangs will take place, uh, both uh, giving some sort of legal assurance, perhaps, uh, or uh, threatening legal consequences if certain sets of bargains are done, uh, is something that can be on the table now. In the long term, uh, we can, um, I use we both as the United States and the community, international community more broadly, mm. can think about how to be strengthening the state uh, uh, and weakening uh, the criminal groups as more opportunities emerge. Uh, you know, we want to get in a situation where the criminal groups are so powerful that the bargaining is about anything beyond, instead of going to prison for 20 years, you will go to prison for 10 years if you are a gang leader. So we want to be in a situation where the bargaining is essentially about pre-bargains, mm. but we are far from that. Mm. But it doesn't mean that we have to be stuck in the situations where the gangs are so powerful. Very little known is the fact that in the late uh, 1980s, early 1990s, uh, the um, uh, Colombian government uh, had extensive negotiations with some of the most uh, odious criminal groups, the Medellin cartel. Mm. And in the first iteration of the negotiations, the bargain that they struck uh, was really a bargain that empowered uh, uh, the cartel significantly, and that was um, uh, that left the state with a very weak hand. The state conceded to many elements, allowing Pablo Escobar to build his uh, luxurious private prison that he would go in and out, uh, not acting against a set of actors. But fortunately, and that could have been the end of the bargain, the, the state could have been perpetually weak. Fortunately, um, the Colombian um, uh, political class and civil society found the strength and very low with US help to be st uh, strengthening institutions. And uh, uh, with US prodding, uh, years later, the power changed. The national police became more capacious and a uh, set of consequences uh, took place against uh, the criminal groups. Um, Escobar himself was killed, uh, but uh, prosecutions of the Cali cartel followed and the cartel was dismantled. Other cartels emerged. Uh, it's hardly a resolved picture. Colombia is still torn by violence. Uh, but nonetheless, the state was able to go from really um, just a shredding of institutions uh, toward their strengthening, even at the time where the bargain was originally struck, the criminal bar the, the bargain with the criminal actors was originally struck amid, amid intense uh, weakness. So whatever bargains are done today with the gangs, 
one would hope that in time the bargains would be renegotiated and that the state would become strengthened and more and more the bargains would be about the extent of punishment, would be about more capacious uh, DDR rather than um, payoffs uh, for uh, allowing humanitarian access uh, or payoffs for um, turning violence down as uh, has been the case up till now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that very, very thoughtful and relevant analysis. We really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you for having me.